Hi, um, thanks very much, Carl, and the committee for inviting me. And um, it, it's always um, really good to be here. And, and the, that interdisciplinary message is one I hope I live, li uh, leave you with. Um, it'll, it'll go a little bit fast, this talk, but I believe it's being videoed. So maybe on the second or third look, it'll make some sense to some of you. Um, I'd like to start off with acknowledgement. So um, our, our ability to begin to understand type 1 diabetes and think about possible therapeutic pathways is, is only due to sustained funding from the JDRF and the Wellcome Trust um, year after year of, of toil, sweat and tears. And, and without that continuity, it, it's not really possible to embark on the sort of experiments that, that we've been playing around with in the last 20 years. So um, thank you very much to them. And also, um, Oops. I'd like to thank everyone in the Cambridge uh, DIL, um, most of whom uh, we left behind, unfortunately, but a hard core of immunology and statistics came over to uh, Oxford, the Cambridge, um, the Wellcome Trust Centre for Human Genetics, uh, in, and including um, my uh, long-standing collaborator, uh, Linda Wicker. And um, I'd like to thank everyone that was in the lab for the last 20 years and, and uh, the new recruits uh, in Oxford that we're now hiring, um, uh, good luck to them. So um, uh, Oxford is uh, just like Cambridge, it's a very exciting, very deep place. There's an expert on everything at every, round every corner. Um, you just have to encourage your students and postdocs to go out and, and knock on their door. Um, it's a little bit bigger than Cambridge. Um, the uh, medical research, is, uh, the clinical school is a little bit further on. And one of the most recent developments, which is now completely relevant to our research, um, is the investment by Nova Nordisk. And they, they will occupy part of our building, that's the Wellcome Trust Centre for Human Genetics there, um, uh, for a period of a couple of years until their new building is put up next door. Um, and I, I hope that this will represent a true integration of um, a pharmaceutical company that actually currently has an active budget um, and academic research uh, where we can talk a lot about pre-competitive research and not worry too much about the things that have to be absolutely confidential. So uh, one, one of the tools that it, it's slightly in hibernation at the minute that Ollie Byrne and his colleagues um, made is, is immunobase. And um, uh, uh, in immunobase, currently, there are only 57 um, confirmed uh, established GWAS significant regions for type 1 diabetes. And of course, uh, 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 polygene uh, gene people, there, there's probably well over 1,000 regions of the genome that determine susceptibility to type 1 diabetes. We may never map all of them. Um, 57 is a bit on the low side. I'd much prefer 150. I'm not, I'm not too greedy. But of that 57, uh, if, if we uh, uh, stare at that uh, for long enough and, and do research in the lab and in the literature and, and, and with um, uh, uh, more specialized bioinformatics techniques, we can begin al already to gain insights um, into the disease pathogenesis over and above what we knew previously from candidate gene studies, which is basically the HLA and insulin gene regions. Um, one feature of uh, type 1 diabetes susceptibility is its unique association with HLA in that there's a whole pile of alleles and haplotypes that predispose to the disease. There's a pile in the middle that are neutral, um, that can't make up their mind, and then there's a pile at the far end that are dominantly protective, so one copy um, will, will um, nullify the susceptibility from DR3 and 4. And the uh, proven causal gene for uh, that, um, for a whole variety of evidence, is, is an allele of, of DQB1 called DQ6. And uh, it, it uh, stands as one of the great mysteries. Uh, um, uh, when I first started doing type 1 diabetes genetics in Stanford, that, that I was lucky enough to discover, uh, um, in those days we called it an association, we'd call it a SNP now, in this gene with uh, protection and susceptibility to type 1 diabetes. And uh, that, that was quite a while ago, and we, we still don't really have a handle on the mechanism. However, um, as Carl said, um, I always get a bit overexcited about research, but I must say I totally agree with them. I think there was a never a better time with regards to technology, information, information mining, and information sharing. 
for um, more rapidly beginning to understand the basic mechanisms of disease and, and maybe also thinking about what pathways may be therapeutically uh, accessible. So um, an example of this is a paper that we've waited almost 30 years for where um, Pritchard and Garcia um, uh, used um, TCR um, sequencing. So many groups have claimed they could sequence the T-cell receptor repertoire and the B-cell receptor repertoire. But up until recently, um, those claims were not really founded. They weren't um, uh, correctly um, representing, capturing the amazing repertoire of, of TCR, uh, beta and, and alpha and gamma delta um, uh, variable sequences. But, but with uh, PCR trick and, uh, tricks and next generation sequencing, several groups have now achieved that. So that means we can, um, as in this paper, they were able to, to analyze the genetic control of TCR, um, uh, V-beta and V-alpha sequences. And of course, the major locus, thank goodness, turns out to be HLA, um, including uh, narrowing down to some of our uh, uh, favorite amino acids that predispose them to protect to type 1 diabetes and other common autoimmune diseases. Um, so one of the um, projects that I would like to do in Oxford, and we have the clinical, beautiful clinical samples uh, to do the experiment, is to really dig into this and, and find out exactly what in the naive T cell repertoire is missing or added when you're DQ6 positive uh, versus um, the most susceptible genotype is DR3, 4. What's the difference in the repertoire, both in the most naive repertoire in humans, um, T cells that have just recently left the thymus, versus autoreactive activated uh, T cells in autoimmune patients versus the appropriate controls. But most um, challenging and interesting of all is that um, uh, two or three groups, including Mark Davis and Stanford, are working out that once from single cell genomics, the, you know, the other incredible um, uh, disruption in, in technological ability, from single cell genomics, you can work out what the pairs are of alpha, beta, or gamma, delta. And from that information, if you clone those receptors, you can begin using much tougher and more challenging approaches, what peptides bind those particular receptors that are determined by the HLA uh, haplotypes. And, and that's, um, that's a, uh, instead of looking at lesions and looking at what T cell receptors and what T cells are in there, that's a, a pure uh, genetics approach to the problem. And it, it only became possible last year. Um, and it is high up my list to um, do. So back to immunobase, uh, the, the second or third most important locus after HLA um, is on chromosome 11, and, and there's a major candidate gene in there that was identified by Graham Bell in, in 1984, um, and it's the insulin gene itself, and polymorphisms in that uh, gene um, undoubtedly influence its expression in the pancreas, but probably most relevantly in the thymus. So if you get more insulin expressed in the thymus, you're more tolerant to the antigen. Now, um, type 1 diabetes has long, uh, long awaited, in contrast to other diseases, post-translationally modified forms of your favorite autoantigens, uh, PTMs. And I, I just want to, and, and it sent our field into some panic because it means that the preproinsulin or GAD or IA2, ZNT peptides that we've been studying and analyzing all these years with tetramers and, and proliferation assays, those, those peptides May, may not actually be the right peptides. The right peptides with higher affinity, higher proliferative capacity, may be those that have been post-translationally modified, citrullated, or more remarkably for class one and class two, published recently in Science and Nature Medicine, um, cleaved peptides, peptides that come from different proteins or from different places within the same protein. And that's particularly relevant to a very protein-crowded uh, crowded, uh, secretory granule which contains insulin and amylin at high concentrations where there's every opportunity to get transpeptidation and hybrid peptides. Um, and I'm, I'm going to call those neoantigens. They may be produced much more in a stressed beta cell theme I'll expand on. Um, so I'm, I, uh, the, the genetic result of, of insulin was known in 84. We did the fine mapping. A guy called Brian Barrett uh, did some detailed fine mapping, and it, it does indeed map to the promoter of the insulin gene. And uh, we did gene expression studies in human thymus. 
Um, there is a major trial ongoing eating insulin in newly diagnosed cases, in mostly in, in adults, uh, run by a huge organization called TrialNet. And, and I fear that um, since the autoimmunity will have spread to many islet proteins and many epitopes within those, um, I, I fear that eating insulin uh, to res um, uh, improve oral tolerance, it may be too late. Um, nevertheless, I could be wrong in the announcement. The results are, um, will be announced apparently at the ADA meeting this fall in the States. Notwithstanding that, I think it's much more likely that Ezio Bonifacio and Annette Ziegler's approach in Germany, um, where we aim to run an RCT uh, in newborn children to feed them insulin to uh, promote neonatal tolerance, um, when all the mechanisms, all the um, systems are in place for children to become tolerant to their commensal bacteria and, and to food antigens. Um, and, 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 and that will probably be the most ambitious collaboration and project I've ever embarked on, because we'll have to HLA and genetically test hundreds of thousands of newborns um, uh, to get enough um, uh, individuals consented in, into this primary prevention study. Um, we've, um, we've, in Germany in particular, there's been enormous progress made towards this, and I think this is the greatest chance of, of um, targeted immune tolerance re uh, restoration um, if, if we can um, add insulin to um, children's food in the first few months of life. <clears throat> and that's funded by the, well, uh, by the Helmsley Trust already. So um, what, what progress are we making in identifying genes in those 57 regions out, outside HLA and insulin? Um, so um, uh, we, as I said, we've already gained insight into several pathways. I'll talk a little bit about the interleukin pathway. Um, we've made links, genetic links with the uh, microbiome. We've, we've got a major link um, with a gene uh, that encodes MDA5 with type 1 interferon and uh, low-level virus infection and recurrent respiratory virus infections are almost certainly now environmental exposures that are important for type 1 diabetes in children. Uh, type 1 diabetes begins at birth probably with major parental influences, but in fact in most kids who eventually are diagnosed with the disease, the autoimmunity is in place by age three years. It, it's sort of all over by age three, um, the established autoimmunity. Um, so, um, one of the um, issues that you're all aware of is that when you identify a GWAS region, it's just a, a, a region, you're, you're not absolutely sure um, what the causal gene or genes in that region is. Um, you are um, more than happy to apply all your biases, and that's exactly what we've done. If we didn't find an immune response gene that we liked in a region, we wouldn't name a candidate gene. Um, and, and, and that bias um, uh, stretches quite far. Um, but um, there were some of the regions, for example, I've just pulled this one out, where the peak of the association was in a gene called renalase, uh, an absolutely terrible candidate for anything except perhaps kidney disease. And, um, uh, and, and with the latest technology, we, we were able to actually identify a much more likely uh, candidate gene in this region uh, by uh, sequencing the contacts between promoters and enhancers. So th this is the technology that some of you will be aware of uh, by formaldehyde cross-linking and next-gen sequencing. You, you can sequence the contacts uh, in a whole variety of, um, even in primary cells. And this consortium, headed by Peter Fraser and Willem Arhan, Chris Wallace and others, um, uh, 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 led the uh, so-called high C analysis in these cells. And the um, results were just published in, in, uh, in this paper in Cell. Um, and uh, uh, even though our lab was um, heavily involved in that, I am, am going to say it's an amazing paper. And uh, almost every uh, table in that is a complete treasure trove and will take months, if not years, to mine. One of my favorite is supplementary table three, where all, all the hits are listed according to disease uh, with the highest scores of the high C promoter enhancer interaction. And out of that are lots of new candidate genes in, in our favorite regions. Um, in some of our regions where we would have sworn that's the candidate gene, 
It's the, uh, uh, that uh, physical evidence now points to a different one. And as I said, the answer for P10, uh, for RNLS, renally is maybe the uh, P10 gene. Uh, and not only um, uh, Ollie Burren and his team have made a really nice bioinformatics tool uh, for you to visualize that. And Chris will talk about this uh, in much more detail on, on Wednesday. Um, P10 is of enormous interest, not only in cancer. Uh, Holm uh, will talk about it, I hope, in uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And Anna Glowin and Mark McCarthy are interested in, in type 2 diabetes, also in Oxford. So it, 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 it didn't take a lot of uh, bioinformatics effort to realize that the IL-2 pathway was a major uh, contributor to susceptibility and resistance to type 1 diabetes, with almost all of the major players in the IL-2 pathway um, uh, named as uh, candidate causal genes in the disease. And uh, uh, Dan will give um, a so-called lightning talk, uh, a one-minute suicide talk, I think later today. Um, um, and his paper is in preparation, where, where, and he'll tell you all about this. You can read the title, the current title of the paper. But we still are fine mapping genes um, and variants with every tool and shared database that we can possibly get our hands on. So sharing of genotypes, EQTL information, it's, it's now really, really key to do that as soon as you possibly can, and then that will accelerate discovery and uh, better understanding of disease. So clinically, the breakthrough for um, uh, low-dose IL-2 came in 2011 compared to high-dose IL-2, which is used in cancer therapy. And uh, these two papers were back-to-back -back in New England Journal of Medicine. And they showed clinical benefit in two immune inflammatory diseases, graft-versus-host and vasculitis. Um, uh, roughly, their dosing regime was about a million units a day. Um, uh, we decided um, to take a complete step back and for the first time analyze in great detail in, in 40 patients with type 1 diabetes what the effect of one dose of, of IL-2 might have on the immune system. We didn't aim to test the preservation of beta cell function. You measure that by measuring C-peptide in the blood. We just wanted to go back to the beginning and said, how many, uh, what happens if you give a dose and what sort of dose do you have to give to see if you can raise T, regulatory, T regulatory frequency from baseline before you give the dose of the drug. Um, uh, is there a way of establishing a dose that will give a predicted increase in T reg frequency? So, um, as I said, we weren't out to cure diabetes in this initial experimental medicine study, um, but um, we did discover a, a, a couple of totally unexpected things about the effect of IL-2 on the, on the human immune system, some of which weren't even discovered in, in mice, which have been pumped full of IL-2 over the years. Um, but nobody quite done the experiment uh, the way we'd done it. So first of all, there was a technological breakthrough, a company called Mesoscale that has identified a way of um, removing the background in ELISA type assays. We still don't know how they do it but to achieve fendogram reliably, uh, quantitative fendogram levels of uh, uh, cytokines like IL-2 and IL-10. And uh, um, Linda put them through their paces by sending them blinded spike sam samples, the usual, and uh, their assay um, uh, even passed Linda's standards of, of, of QC and QA. And we applied it to our first um, uh, early phase trial, DIL-T1D, um, by measuring the PK of the drug, uh, prolucan or aldous lucan, um, in the blood 90 minutes and then one day, two day, three day after the injection. Um, the drug reaches a peak uh, way above that required uh, to activate uh, T effector cells um, and, and then it reaches baseline. I, I know it sounds a little bit um, boastful or uh, arrogant, but with this assay, uh, I believe that we were the first ever to measure true baseline levels of this incredibly important cytokine, IL-2. Um, and to begin to identify markers of normal immune homeostasis uh, during immune monitoring, and these are all uh, buzz phrases now currently going forward, you need to be absolutely sure that you have a sensitive enough assay to measure baseline so you can estimate changes above baseline. Um, and um, so that was one thing, and, and this decline in the um, IL-2 concentration in the blood 
the half, uh, corresponded uh, quite well with the known half-life of the drug on subcutaneous injection. Um, the first really big surprise was that after 90 minutes and a day um, taking blood samples from these patients with different doses of, of the drug, uh, we, we just assumed that Tregs would go up because Tregs love IL-2. But the first thing they do is go down on the blood. And um, they, in, the, in lab meetings, they used to call this Todd's beloved dip because we, for months, we didn't believe it. Um, but what, what's, and what's happened here is that IL-2 has had a big impact on tissue residency and trafficking of, of T regulatory cells. And our attention and everybody else's attention in this room has, has now turned to what's, what's happening in tissues. And uh, that's a tough thing in the pancreas, but uh, other researchers who can access joints and guts will, will soon lead the pathway to really understanding what's critical um, so, for example, NK, 50 cell, uh, NK cells, natural killer cells that are 56 bright, 95% of them never go into the circulation. They're happily resident in tissues. And evidence from an ex-PhD student in the lab, Charlie Bell, suggests, as has others, that those NK56 bright cells are regulatory, as if there's a whole regulatory arm of the innate immune system, as well as the adaptive immune system by Tregs. You can see quite happily um, after the single doses, the Tregs rebound back and uh, at, at higher doses uh, have 20% increases above baseline. Um, the other um, surprise that we didn't expect um, was that, uh, again, um, counterintuitive was that the, uh, particularly the higher doses of IL-2, um, uh, actually, and, and even the lower dose, um, changed the expression of the signaling receptor on, on these cells, CD122, uh, the beta chain of the trimeric uh, IL-2 receptor. And you can see there's a very dramatic uh, 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 removal or uh, uh, disappearance of, of this key signaling arm of the receptor, subunit of the receptor, from the surface of memory Tregs. And that actually does result in a decrease in sensitivity of these cells to IL-2 measured by PSTAT5. Um, so um, in humans, um, with very low doses of IL-2, you get an initial desensitization of the cells that are remaining in the circulation. Now, that might not be the case of a cell happily cuddling up to a dendritic cell in a tissue, in an islet, in a lymph node. Uh, we don't know, obviously. But it certainly was a surprise result and suggests that giving a million units a day may not be the best approach to the uh, dosing regime for IL-2. Um, uh, there are several exciting stories that I can't tell you today owing to time limitations. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, and one is from Ricardo Ferreira, who discovered um, an IL-6 receptor high population of Tregs. Um, in, in, in the blood after IL-2 treatment. So IL-2 mobilizes these cells so you can see them in the circulation. Normally they're very rare, um, but with IL-2 mobilization they appear in the circulation and Ricardo has begun to phenotype them and will have much joy applying single cell genomics to unravel the heterogeneity of, of this TIGIT negative uh, IL-6 receptor positive uh, T cell that's also uh, rho gamma T uh, positive. However, there's, there's a problem with this. So, so far, it's all about immunology, right? So unfortunately, there's a classic model of type 1 diabetes that's ruled the roost for um, decades. And that's, um, you get diabetes, uh, type 1 diabetes, when almost all of your beta cells are destroyed or lysed by cytotoxic uh, T cells, CD8 T cells, CD4s, and cytokines. When you've lost as many as 80, 90%, you become insulin deficient, and you have to start injecting insulin several times a day for the rest of your life. That's the only drug that actually is currently available for type 1 diabetes. Um, and, and that model um, has really, it's in every textbook, and it's referenced in every paper. However, the recent evidence, and actually some old evidence, so some evidence of willful blindness going on in our field, which is of a, uh, you know, human nature, um, uh, more recently, people have gone back and done autopsy pancreas, particularly in uh, a JDRF-funded um, resource called NPOD. And uh, uh, at diagnosis, and, and even before diagnosis, incredibly, they can get autopsy pancreas and section it and study 
the cells in, 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 those, in those rescued tissues. Um, insulitis is extremely rare. It's nothing like the spontaneous mouse model NOD, which, where the um, islets almost end up looking like lymph nodes. They're so heavily infiltrated. You can hardly find a lymphocyte. Um, furthermore, the, uh, the pathology is uh, peculiar. Um, some islets are completely uh, devoid of beta cells because of immune destruction or whatever. But the islet next door, little bags of beta cells, it's completely fine. The beta cells are all in there. They're, they're insulin positive, but they're, in a diabetic, they're not secreting insulin for, for some reason. Um, and, and, and actually, um, that's been referred to as patchy or vitiligo-like. But immunologists have, with soluble cytokines, and CTLs darting all over the place have, have difficulty um, modeling why an islet, uh, two islets side by side, one normal and one devoid of beta cells, how that could happen. Um, as I said, many pa patients have insulin positive beta cells and, and on eating food they do make insulin still and it turns out you only need a few hundred micromole, uh, micromole nanomole of C peptide to avoid all the dreadful complications of diabetes. And yet over 35 years of immunotherapy has, has failed to save even some of that C peptide. Um, so there's something really peculiar going on, as if maybe the uh, uh, HLA uh, insulin autoimmunity has kicked off some intrinsic process in beta cells that, that hasn't much to do with the immune system at all that would work independently of the immune system such that even if, if, if we threw the best immunotherapeutic combination on the planet uh, at newly diagnosed cases, uh, even with long-term treatment, which might compromise the immune system anyway, we, we might not succeed in preserving that C-peptide function. So the new model, and I'm not the only one talking about this general idea, although I have a specific uh, human genetic link I'd like to tell you about today, is that it's a combination of primary autoimmunity and beta cell uh, degeneration, much like neuronal uh, degeneration in neurodegenerative diseases. So again, we have to go back to the genetics because um, when you have a confirmed association, that gives you a little nugget of causality. And uh, you notice this region on chromosome seven never had a, a named candidate gene. And the reason for that is there isn't an obvious immune response gene, as I said earlier. Um, but this interval um, <clears throat> contains one of the most famous genes in the genome, the gene that includes um, tau, and tau is instrumental in Alzheimer and Parkinson's disease. And um, I noticed that uh, the association of this region with type 1 diabetes and also, interestingly, uh, primary biliary cirrhosis, uh, this association is identical between type 1 diabetes. Same SNPs, same inversion, same direction. Um, this is a known EQTL locus. It looks as if uh, more MAPT, more tau. Um, tau is a microtubule protein that helps microtubules function. Microtubules are really important for insulin secretion and neuronal protein secretion because these cargoes of granules or proteins are carted out microtubules out of the cell. So if you even get quite mild uh, decreases in microtubule function, um, which could happen when tau is phosphorylated and drops off the microtubules, that could predispose you to a range of diseases. So w once I found that association, I immediately went on Google and PubMed and discovered that years ago, never followed up really, um, people, uh, other, other groups in beta cell uh, and islets had, had discovered that tau was expressed in, in, in insulin secreting cell lines. But an interesting, as is uh, common in science, um, some in interesting observations, many of which are false, um, and this one isn't, um, are ignored or never really followed up. Maybe a PhD student finished the project and left, or funding ran out. Um, bizarrely, uh, this antibody in um, Santa Cruz website, uh, this is an antibody supposedly to tau, but instead of staining uh, uh, neuronal cells or brain sections, uh, unbelievably, they decided to stay in islets and discovered tau expression. I, I, I remember that distinctly because uh, I was emailing Peter St. George Hislop at the time in, in the CIMR. It was the 4th of July and uh, we had a very uh, animated conversation that day by email um, celebrating the 4th and uh, this additional information. And then trawling through the literature, this laboratory uh, 
Patrick McGear's lab, who's still active in the field, um, published these stainings where uh, the very date potentially toxic phosphorylated tau is seen in type 2 diabetes pancreas sections. Um, but not only tau, but also um, a beta amyloid, the protein behind Alzheimer's disease. And at the R RNA level, there's more beta, um, beta amyloid RNA than tau RNA. And um, these two proteins together from the neurological neurodegenerative research are a, a very toxic, potentially toxic combination. You really don't want to be overexpressing either um, aggregate or conformers of these molecules, and they may, they may act together. Um, and yet here we have a beta cell, probably with the biggest protein secretion load uh, in, in the body. Millions of molecules have cleaved and folded in insulin per minute when, when you eat some food to, to create that pulsatile insulin secretion that's, that's absolutely essential for health. Um, we have three major amylogenic proteins expressed in this cell. Amylin, or IAPP, which is famously associated with type 2 diabetes, but not genetically associated with either disease in humans. Um, uh, tau and A-beta. And, and again, research in IAPP, or amylin, sort of fell through the cracks. And it, it's never, maybe it's been clouded by overexpressing transgenic mouse models in rats and, and mice that are difficult to interpret. Who knows? But again, much more research should have been done on, on, on this type of protein class. So uh, about a, a year and a half ago, um, uh, Sarah Howlett, an ex-postdoc in the lab, Cara Rainbow, um, and Joe Chambers, a collaboration with the labs next door in the CIMR, started to assess uh, what are the uh, anti tau bodies that really see tau, because most of them don't, as is the case for almost every other protein and the uh, so-called specific antibodies. But these three antibodies are known to definitely see tau. And th this is their staining in pancreas sections, formalin-fixed paraffin-embedded pancreas, standard immunocytochemistry. Um, and you can see that uh, all three antibodies, tau 46, 57, and H150, stay in the islets within the uh, human pancreas. And, and um, I like this picture not only because of the negativity of the antibody control and the positivity of three different antibodies, but I, I must say that islets are really beautiful. And it shows you that they really are only 1% or 2% of the um, entire pancreas, and, and yet their function is essential for life. Um, so I want to focus on, on my favorite islet, which is this little heart-shaped one here, um, and I'm going to blow up the magnification. Um, and uh, it, um, Sarah stained with uh, an antibody to insulin, and uh, this is the classic insulin stain of, of beta cells inside an islet. An islet's full of beta cells mostly, and alpha cells that make glucagon. And then she stained the same section with glucagon. And the alpha cells in humans surround the beta cells. So this is a classic picture of gl glucagon staining. And then this is a blown up version of tau. And then critically, the co-localization shows that tau and insulin co-localize together in the beta cells. And to my knowledge, this is the first time that this has actually been shown in, in real human normal pancreas uh, rather than a, a, a cell line that might be neoplastic and maybe doing crazy things. So a major project in Oxford, which has uh, lots of beta cell expertise, will be to explore how tau expression affects insulin secretion and also take an incredibly exciting visa, uh, vista on uh, neurodegenerative uh, therapeutics and approaches and repositioning them towards not just type 1 diabetes but also type 2 diabetes because everything I've said or speculated about this would apply to a type 2 diabetic uh, beta cell as well as a type 1. There is um, much uh, firmer grounds genetic back to human genetics. If we go back to immunobase on chromosome 9, there's a, a gene we named the candidate gene because rare mutations of this cause neonatal diabetes. And the gene has been firmly associated uh, by us and others with type 1 diabetes. But critically, it's a confirmed type 2 diabetes locus. Same SNPs, same direction, same everything. It, it's almost certainly the causal gene um, uh, in, in this region predisposing to type 1 and type 2. Notice there are no other autoimmune disease listed. Uh, this association is unique for type 1 diabetes. And I know we always rabbit on about shared loci between autoimmune diseases and how interesting it is. 
I actually prefer looking for the T1D unique ones because they might be more specific to T1D. Genes like PTPN22, TIC2, um, other genes that are associated with multiple diseases, those probably occupy the most critical checkpoints in immunity. And I'm not sure, at least in type 1 diabetes, I'd want to play around with that in children long term. In fact, I definitely wouldn't. Um, so, uh, as I said, uh, th there is a, a confirmed and very uh, solid uh, and exciting connection. Um, um, and the, the, I think the best work in this area was a PLOS uh, genetics paper from Desio Ezric and colleagues in 2013 that I had the pleasure to review, where they showed it convincingly that GLIS3 operates in uh, beta cell apoptosis in a range of cell lines and, and annulates. And then um, it was an even greater pleasure to measure Adrian Liston's paper last year in Nature Genetics, where um, he made a model of diabetes in the, in the autoimmune di uh, NOD mouse where, he, um, where he'd removed the immune system. So these were NOD mice with no immune system left, so they didn't get autoimmune diabetes. But Adrian noticed that they got a non-autoimmune um, form of the disease. And he did what mouse uh, geneticists do and human geneticists, he did some genetics. And he mapped uh, genetic control of this uh, non-autoimmune diabetes of, of the pancreas to two regions of the mouse genome. And one of them I knew quite well, um, the nerd that I am, because I knew it contained the orthologue of GLIS3. And uh, Adrian and his lab followed that up and presented convincing mechanistic data that GLIS3 was a causal gene in this region of the mouse genome. Um, uh, predisposing to this form of diabetes through apoptosis and uh, a beta, a beta cell stress. Uh, out of that, um, and I had, as I said, I had the privilege of writing the news and views, um, it, and, and what's really exciting about Adrian's study is, is not only does he join with human genetics type 1 and type 2 up together, but he, he also uh, links in a high-fat diet stress factor and high-fat diet in this model mimics the effects of the GLIS3 and the other locus, um, uh, showing a, a really convincing interaction between a chief environmental exposure, both for type 1 and type 2, um, and, and disease mechanism. And it made me think that uh, I wrote in this about a, a paper published years ago um, um, where class 1 overexpression in beta cells causes them to be, uh, get indigestion and, and apoptose and form diabetes. And in fact, HLA class 1 expression on beta cells is confirmed. It's a, one of the hallmarks of autopsy pancreas. And maybe it's a two-age steward. It's presenting antigen and peptide to uh, CD8 T cells. But maybe it's also increasing endoplasmic reticulum stress. So now I spend a bit of my time uh, looking at uh, drugs and pathways uh, in proteostasis to look for opportunities to reposition that knowledge and maybe some of those drugs to type 1 diabetes susceptibility. And Adrian and I have expanded recently on, on this model. Um, if you go to the human protein atlas, um, probably my second favorite database next to immunobase, um, you can see that um, tau is expressed exceptionally in other tissues, again, bizarrely overlooked. And uh, one of the, uh, obviously, peripheral nerves express it. And um, uh, colleagues in Exeter have stained human pancreas and stained the amazing uh, nerve bundles in the human pancreas that are absolutely roaring with tau. And, and every tissue in our body obviously relies on peripheral nerve function um, for normal function. There's a cell type in kidney that probably expresses tau. Um, Weird, isn't it? And also, muscle expresses tau very highly, maybe in myocytes. And that, that connection linked me to a disease I'd never really heard about uh, with, with uh, some, some help from Marcin Bakalski, a postdoc in the lab. So who, who of you um, have worked or heard of inclusion body myositis? A show of hands. Saucer. Oh, it's a better showing than San Francisco a couple of weeks ago, where two people out of 350 put their hands up. Maybe they're more modest than California. Um, but we had five hands go up there. I had never heard of this disease until, uh, you know, two or three months ago. And when I began reading about it, I discovered a complete parallel universe of a disease that looks almost identical to um, type 1 diabetes beta cells, with the same doubts and fears, the same debates, the same everything. 
Um, and yet, um, as I said, we rabbit on about looking at other diseases, and at least in the type 1 diabetes field, we'd hardly ever looked outwards to diseases that might uh, give us lessons about type 1 diabetes and what not to do and what to do. So this is a review in all places, New England Journal of Medicine, and uh, what's, what led me there is the fact that these inclusion bodies contain some of our favorite proteins, like phosphorylated tau, which is, which is not good news. Um, cytotoxic T cells involved, HLA associated, uh, abnormal proteostasis, aging, yep. uh, viruses, yeah, definitely. Uh, the word degeneration, uh, battling inflammation, uh, cell stress, and fiber damage. Uh, HLA class one expression, perforin, aging, HLA, all sounds incredibly familiar. Um, and then cytokines and chemokines richly involved in type 1 diabetes in humans, um, in particular uh, CXCL3 and its receptor CXCR10, um, sorry, CXCL10 and its receptor. Um, and, and then not talked about in type 1 diabetes until um, me blethering on about tau and, and uh, uh, APP, um, accumulation of misfolded proteins which um, the ER is meant to deal with and the unfolding protein response. And these proteins have been found um, in these so-called inclusion bodies. Um, and as I said, leading to a model of degeneration. And, and they beat themselves up because guess what? Years and years of immunotherapeutic trials have failed in this disease. And they said, well, maybe it's not inflammation. Maybe the degeneration is more important. But as usual in biology, it's probably both that are important. And the HLA genetics would probably tell you the autoimmunity is primary, uh, certainly in type 1 diabetes, and, and then that leads to downstream events um, that, that, that uh, lead to the final demise of the beta cell and maybe the myocyte. What almost anything will induce uh, phosphorylation of tau uh, and, and make it fall off the microtubules. Uh, free tau in the cytoplasm is, is not good news, whether it's phosphorylated or not. Uh, so hyperglycemia, uh, end-stage glycated products, interferon gamma, big inducer of phosphorylated tau, decreased insulin signaling, uh, i.e. insulin resistance, chronic ER stress with a UPR can't cope, and of course aging. Um, uh, IBM only occurs really in people over the age of 50. In type 1 diabetes, you say, well, it occurs in children, uh, John. No, well, half the cases occur in adults of type 1 diabetes di diagnosis. And, and interestingly, that once the autoimmunity is, in set, is set, it's now known from Annette Ziegler and Netze Bonifacio in Germany that on average a person has 11% chance of being diagnosed every year of their life after they become double autoantibody positive by age three. That's a very stochastic process, but would be in line with a gentle age, or maybe not so gentle, aging process of beta cells, myocytes, and every cell in the body is going to age at a different rate. Um, and aging is particularly important for cells that uh, don't regenerate easily. Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm going to go the Stephen Hawking route here and go uh, theory of everything, which is extremely worrying uh, for me, and I'm seeking therapy. Um, so Alzheimer, people now call it type 3 diabetes because diabetes is so common in Alzheimer. The Alzheimer's guy think it's, um, you can read the reviews, oh, it's insulin signaling defects in the brain, of course. Every neurologist I've ever spoken to in the last year and a half just does stuff in the brain. They never look at an organ outside the brain. Um, but one, one possibility for the commonality of type, type 3 diabetes, which is called a risk factor for Alzheimer, is that it's a system-wide failure in protein trafficking, dealing with aggregates, uh, dealing with phosphorylated tau, um, modulating that in a series of phosphatases and kinases, so that every cell that expresses a bit more than ordinary than other cells, uh, with aging, with hyperglycemia, with uh, inflammation, with genetic susceptibility, with all those factors, you, you get um, uh, phosphorylated tau and tau toxicity and other uh, amyloid toxicities happening in cells all over your body. Uh, in particular, tissues and cells that secrete a lot of protein and require superb first-class five-star uh, proteostasis. So maybe, uh, and this is the crazy bit, well, it's all crazy, but um, certain cells in the kidney, I'm not sure which, um, 
if, if they are um, um, having a problem with uh, amylogenesis, uh, they could be a reason for diabetic nephropathy. Um, and similarly, uh, if peripheral neurons aren't having a happy time, uh, time with tau, it could be a, an explanation for neuropathy. Um, almost is nothing known about the genetics of these two conditions because they're so complex. But, but maybe um, it's, um, and we will, I'll be doing this in Oxford, considering these uh, possibilities. So um, finally, another throwaway slide to, um, uh, um, and there's lots of literature from, for some of this stuff from respectable reproducible labs. But um, I, many of you will know that, surprisingly, some of the top GWASH candidate genes um, are uh, innate immunity genes or immunity genes. And, and one of our favorites, led by uh, Marcin Bakalski, a senior postdoc in the lab, is complement receptor 1, um, which, which is a receptor for microbes. There's an emerging literature that uh, nobody's quite sure, amazingly, what the function of A-beta is. But um, there's, there's an emerging feeling that it might have an antimicrobial function. And there's certainly some evidence uh, in the literature uh, linking um, uh, certain bacteria to Alzheimer uh, in a perhaps similar way to linking, of, more obviously, bacteria to um, uh, uh, periodontitis in, in um, uh, poor dental care, um, which, which is a much a firmer association uh, and is a risk factor for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, I draw attention to Marson's paper, which is under review and is published in BioArchive, where amazingly he's discovered that naive human T cells are absolutely covered in complement receptor 1 and complement receptor 2. So these are classic adaptive immune cells covered with um, high expression of um, some of the most famous innate immune receptors uh, in, the, in the body. And um, so conclusions, maybe if we want to um, prevent type 1 diabetes, we have to get in there right early before the autoimmunity triggers other bad stuff. And uh, the RCT with the Etzio and Aneta will be called POINT. And, and, and we hope to um, start recruiting next year. Uh, this, this will be the first time there's ever been a UK uh, a newborn cohort for um, um, type 1 diabetes. And I think therapies need to consider, um, with more evidence, of course, autoimmunity and degener de de degeneration. And also some of the drugs that are in, um, being used, uh, like the bilacid detergent Tudka or Udka in primary biliary cirrhosis, um, some of those drugs have very, very few side effects and could possibly uh, be repositioned in this type of scenario um, to treat type 1 diabetes. But I think coming in too late is a waste of time and, and uh, we've wasted enough billions of dollars, uh, perhaps, already. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was a uh, really good uh, keynote way to open the, uh, the meeting, I think. So um, we'll, we'll open the floor for questions. At the front. I think Mike was first, yeah, and then Jeff. Yeah. So, did you predict cross sectional Ah. Uh, so, uh, 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 not in a patronizing way, great question. So, when that, that experiment, the tau knockout um, to uh, models of Alzheimer and tauopathy, was, was a key expression, uh, experiment in contrast to overexpression because those animals didn't get the neurological symptoms. Um, associated with modeling those diseases in mice. And exactly that experiment, of course, has never been done. Um, tau has not been CRISPRed in NOD or in the DBDB model, um, but that's an experiment that, that probably should be done. Um, is um, tau phosphorylation as a toxic biomarker been reported in both those models? Uh, observationally, yes. Um, so, but only, only what people would only look in the brain, of course, they wouldn't look elsewhere. Um, uh, in NOD, interestingly, uh, it's only really reported in the NOD brain once they become diabetic, which sort of fits. Um, but whether a knockout tau on DBDB or in NOD would affect the disease process uh, uh, remains to be determined. Jeff? Um, for the primary prevention trial, 
could you explain a bit how you're going to do the recruitment? Are you going to do a whole population sampling yes. or and prioritizing based on family history or just you know, sort of all kids um, born HLA type? Unfortunately, we can't use solely family history because only 10% of the families have ever heard of type two, uh, 1 diabetes. So we're, we're going to go into the general population. Um, Germany in, in Dresden, Saxony and Munich have really piloted this already. So I'm not talking, it's not complete fantasy, but they um, approach people, uh, parents during pregnancy, um, ask them if, if they'd be interested in joining the study. They take a separate filter card of, of blood drops at birth, um, not interfering at all with the official Guthrie card genetic screening system. And then uh, with LGC, they um, genotype uh, the HLA SNPs and also some non-HLA SNPs to get a genetic risk score. And that genetic risk score is, uh, is a good one because it's been estimated from this huge newborn cohort, an observational study called TEDE. And they've actually got the genetic risk score for the autoimmunity rather than the disease diagnosis. I told you the autoimmunity is at the heart of this disease. And, and they're up to about 10% at the minute. So 90% of the filter cards that uh, are genetically tested won't, won't, go, uh, won't be asked to go into the treatment and placebo arms of the study. And do you have any ability or plan to collect any additional information? I mean, that'd be uh, a great resource to yeah. do all kinds of other cool experiments. Yeah. So. Um, the, the, a couple of things. Um, um, uh, too many vested interests, I think, were part of the reason why the LIFE study in the UK went down in flames and why the American study uh, went down in flames. Both were shut down. Um, neither were op offering an intervention, which I think is absolutely key if you're going to spend that amount of money. Um, but um, we, so we are... Um, we're going to have those blood spots and you can make good DNA and there are actually probably genetic mutations that you can do a lot more about in childhood than a 10% risk of type 1 diabetes. So rare cardiomyopathy mutations, uh, uh, if I had to choose one for atopic dermatitis, uh, I'd choose filagrin uh, from Erwin McLean and Dun you know, I, I could, and, and these discussions have been ongoing. Uh, this will be an unbelievably expensive study, but if, if we make it too complex, it'll never happen. But if we don't provide added value, it won't happen either. So th there's something in the middle. And, and um, the way that um, Hemsley and Etsy and Annette are setting it up is that for that very question, each country can do their own thing. So they can try to assess their balance of recruitment versus uh, um, testing for something that you, you know, really could impact the, the child's development or the child's life. And um, uh, I'm open uh, for suggestions on this. Julian? Do you think that the... I was just wondering whether the, the, the theory that you're proposing might, might be applying in a proportion of, of patients with type 1 diabetes, for example. And if you go back to the clinical phenotypes, whether it, there are a subset of patients who have tau type pathologies as complication of their diabetes? Uh, good question, and not, not studied yet. But there may be um, some clinical phenotype, um, and we, we should certainly start trawling um, that in, in case there is something um, obvious without too much trawling. And there could be. John, you mentioned about the um, genetic associations lining up. Yeah. So I presume you've done fine mapping then using your T1D data, and you found what co-localization with the Alzheimer's and Parkinson's yeah. signals. It's a regulatory variant? Uh, right. There's a big problem with the region. Uh, right. There's an ancient inversion, and there are literally dozens of polymorphisms um, in, in LD with each other. Um, the, um, it just so happens the perfect tag for that inversion, and the, the LD is so strong because it's an inversion, um, is, is the type 1 SNP and the PVC SNP. Um, but um, uh, going back to the Parkinson's people and the frontotemporal dementia people who've been living with the MAPT association for, for years and trying to find MAP it, I gather uh, my cons census view of their opinions is that it could be just the inversion itself that's altering MAPT expression. 
um, and probably expression of other genes in the region. Um, so very unclear because of the nat complex nature, the nature of the region. And do you know if any, um, for example, gene expression studies or other um, genetic association studies around molecular features have actually done a test associating the inversion with their phenotypes? Um, uh, right, you're asking me about the neurological literature now. Um, uh, clinically, um, it, it's cognitive decline that is most closely, in my faint understanding of neuro neurodegenerative disease, cognitive decline is very closely linked to tau pathology and, and the genotype. And, and that fits with the animal modeling, including the um, uh, tau knockout approach. Uh, any other questions? Oh, it's up and if you measure it in CSF. Um, okay. I don't know whether Steve's done that. Um, it, it's increased in CSF, um, et cetera, et cetera. Great. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you once again.